the the film that sticks out the most to me was my mother took us to see Sunset Boulevard and I was about seven and um, I don't at the time people weren't as careful with children as they are now and I don't think she realized the impact of that dead body floating on the swimming pool was on me I mean I wasn't traumatized but it was scary stuff so we went to the movies a lot when I was a kid and it was a time when you had a double bill I loved musicals and when I was a kid I wanted to star in a musical comedy but um, I didn't have the talents and my mother I remember I took tap lessons and I, I really wanted tap lessons because I wanted to they put the cotton patent leather shoes so my mother just put taps on my loafers and I went to <laughs> class and this girl told me I felt embarrassed and this girl behind me she said get your big head out of here. So I took my big head out and I never went back for a tap. I love theater. So I mean, I from the time I was, I think 14, I started getting involved in theater and you know was in theater in high school and university with other studies. But I, I think I just like make-believe. So I loved you know theater. So I started really kind of a theater dance background. And, but I, but I was practical. You know, I knew I wasn't going to make my living off of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I got my degree in mass communications and Russian, but don't ask me anything in Russian. I do not speak Russian anymore. And when I graduated, I liked writing always. And I, then I thought, well, I'm going to be a playwright because I was involved in theater. Mm -hmm. um, but still this imperative to make a living. So when I graduated, I don't know why I got, I think I had a friend in advertising and I thought, well, you know, it could be interesting to be an advertising writer. You know, so I, my first job was in Detroit at a small ad agency, and um, for about a year, I don't know, if it was a year and a half. And I liked it enough. I mean, I liked writing. So I mean, I liked you know creating, putting words together, and creating an image. Um, and then I was involved with one of the producers there, and he said, you know, you really need to go to New York. And and from the time I was probably about ten. I didn't dislike Detroit, but I knew I wasn't going to stay there. I can't explain. I just knew this isn't it, and I'll be going somewhere else. I mean, if you couldn't find a job, you really had to have something wrong with you. So mm -hmm. I went through advertising agencies, but as a secretary. And even though I was always taught, never say that you can type, you know, but I knew I didn't have confidence in myself. So I, I entered as a secretary and quickly enough was hired as a junior you know, copywriter, because they, they asked questions about, you know, it was also the, we call it the tail end, of, it was the benefits of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So even people like me who hadn't participated that much, but I was the age that benefited from it because they were really looking for educated black people, you know, even in New York. So I started out with J. Walter Thompson as a copywriter for a couple of years, and it just grew to just, hate advertising you know so I quit I don't know what, even why I I just quit I just couldn't take it anymore I, this is a, what are you doing you know this is not my spirit to be selling chewing gum so you know and I would float and I would take temp jobs as a secretary and it was kind of a it sounds lowly but it was kind of a good way to enter into different companies and just you know see if you fit see what was going on eventually got a temp job for at ABC News and and I was working for one of the rare women producers at the time, you know. So uh, we, you know, we were talking. She really liked me. We're not talking about a big span of time, but you know, they were looking for black people. And she said, "Do you have a CV?" And I said, "Yes." You know, so I gave her my CV, and she said, "Would you be interested in working in the news department?" Well, I didn't say no, you know. So I never thought about news, but I said, "You know, yeah, why not?" You know. So they had a program where they had hired a about a half a dozen young black people um, to become interns in the news you know, area. So, uh, I mean, I went in there really, you know, not just naive, but, you know, dumb. I didn't know anything about news other than watching it. So we're in this huge room, you know, like when you see things like the president's men, you see how newsrooms were at the time in many cubicles and big spaces. And um, I was at the news desk. It was a huge desk with six or eight men, right? And it was the year of the miniskirt, of course, the beginning. So I come in, and the, they had 
bikers to the left who would go and pick up film because it's still news was still delivered filmed on film so you'd have to it was like crossing the desert you had to cross this room to get to the desk right and not a day passed somebody didn't all go you and you you really thought surely you must be tired of this by now i mean this you know every day this is ridiculous so there i'm at the news desk and uh the guys were very nice to me but sometimes they'd let fly comments about some of the black men who worked there like and i had kept copious notes not on purpose not like i was spying on abc but it was really my mental health pad you know that i kept notes on and i wrote from that pad and you know and had really uh taken good note of the things that were said because i didn't want it to be like oh i imagine that or you know and i didn't care what they thought i didn't care if they said yeah well we don't believe you whatever um and i heard from others that oh you caused quite a stir do you want you know would you think about going to court and i said no I'm not, you know i'd really think about basically saving my ass i feel like i'm losing it here um and i also knew that uh the people like the black people who you know we get in groups we complain and this and that i just knew when the pressure came they would not be behind me because they had jobs they needed i mean these were men older men with families you know what have you they're not going to stick their necks out for you know this thing uh i asked a couple of people you know if you don't have much money where could you go for rest and recuperation basically and one person said tanzania and the other person said oh i know this island in Greece, this little village that's really lovely, you know, and why don't you go there? And I never, ever wanted to go to Greece. Every time I'd see a poster, I'd think, eek, look at that place, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because I took off and flew off to Rhodes and knew nobody, you know, and it was before you had email or internet, so it was like really flying off. And it was a really wonderful rest and recuperation for me. Before I went, I kept having this recurrent dream that I would I would go someplace and it was like the end of the world and I would sit down and there would be nothing before me and the world would be behind me and the world in the sense of problems you know the, everything and so after a couple of weeks in Lindos was the village uh you know I met up with some people and there was an English woman who had been there for years and she would take us on little walks and she took us out on this peninsula to a place called the tomb of Cleovelis and so, you know, walking around, and I sat down, there was a little stone sitting, and I sat down, and I looked out, and it was nothing but the sea ahead of me. And I knew that I had, it's like coming home. I couldn't explain, it was just eerie. It's where I, I needed to be. It's like I understood everything. It was almost like a Castaneda's moment, where you think, oh, it's all come together. I'm a part of everything, everything is a part of me, you know, and I, could, I can't explain it better than that. Then became a kind of a, I wouldn't say a mini disaster in my life, but it might have been the reason I made Killing Time. Um, I came back to New York, and I I was studying Pilates all this time. Okay, so I started at Pilates in 1970, the place where I shot the film. Um, I'd been with Robert as a student all this time. Like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I, I definitely television was out. Uh, what did I? I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then people started saying, you know in the studio and friends, you really should model. And I thought, and it, I just thought, no, I don't think so. Um, and they were pressing me. So I started dropping the weight. I didn't have that much weight, but I dropped the weight. And I was, and I should, all the signs were there, like you're too old to be a model. Uh, it's not for you. You're not that kind of person. But I, I didn't listen because I was listening to the people pushing me. So then uh, this friend, lent me his apartment in Paris, which was very nice of him. And I was supposed to do like, do the rounds, you know, and I would have not have minded doing runway, but I wasn't a photographic model. But I felt like I was being played with and I felt a bit, um, I felt I hadn't listened to my heart. And, I, and, it, and it really kind of shook me up, really. There's this rich woman who was making jewelry that I greatly admired. And so she said, why don't you sign up? So I signed up for the jewelry making class. So I'm making jewelry on the side. I'm not making, I'm learning how to make jewelry. And I'm getting to editing because that's when I realized, hmm, I really like working with my hands. 
And one of the things that came out of ABC is that I love being with the editors and I love watching them, you know, play with film. So I was kind of putting the two together when I thought, well, you like working with your hands and you love movies, you know, maybe see if you can find a film class and try, you know, editing or try, you know, something like that. And that's when I signed up for a film class while I was still with Robert. And it was, um, I didn't want to spend a lot of money because I didn't have a lot of money to spend. And I wasn't sure, you know, is this one more thing that you're going to try and drop, you know? So I found this place called the Women's Inter Art Center and they were offering kind of short-term basic filmmaking classes. And I thought, that's a good way. You go in and you try a little bit of everything. And if it's not for you, not a big loss. And it was two women, Muffy Myers and Ellen Hofter, who were with, I don't know if you know their names, but they're Grey Gardens and they're, you know, filmmakers and, and editors in their own right. And they were just, just lovely. I mean, because we were kind of like, I don't know, chumps. I mean, none of us had any film background. I had probably the most in the sense that I'd worked in media and different ages. I mean, it was, it was women's inter art center, but there were a couple of guys there too. And uh, we got on, we shared, so they taught us basic filmmaking and they would bring in a, a camera person. They'd bring in someone to teach sound. And then uh, they sent us out. And so you t chose your crew from the other classmates. And, you know, they kind of taught you storyboarding, which was very important. Mm -hmm. And um, they wanted to see your, obviously, what your story was before they sent you out to see if, yeah, you're ready for filming. And we chose our crew from our different um, classmates. So when we, I don't know, I don't think mine was the first one shot, but when we made Killing Time, so I chose one of the guys to shoot. He's still a friend. And there weren't that many people to choose from, like, you know, so we sound person, right. blah, blah, blah. And I, I wasn't, I'm not like you, I'm not a, really a director of actors, and I wasn't sure I could pull it off. So I had done acting, so I thought, you know, I'll start with myself, because I don't want, I want someone who's neutral. I didn't want someone who was going to be acting, acting. And it wasn't a big film, it was just like a small idea. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. I think I can manage it, since I had the storyboard. I could direct myself, so I would set up the scene, run behind the camera, say, yeah, that's the shot I want, you know, and then Stephen would shoot it, you know, so it was kind of awkward, but it was okay. But the hardest part, I don't know if you had this at the beginning of filmmaking, was having people believe that you knew what you were doing. <laughs> it was like, believe me, I, I know what I'm doing. No, I think you should put the camera over there. Believe me, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, I think. <laughs> I think they didn't see the film, and that's a hard part when you when the person that's for any director, when you have it in your head, you know what it's going to look like, and everybody else just sees basically a loose mess. <laughs> but you don't understand; it's all going to come together. If a hen and a half can lay an egg and a half in a day and a half, how long will it take a monkey with a wooden leg to kick the seeds out of a dill pickle? So I think it was in total. It certainly wasn't much, it wasn't maybe a year max, but I don't think it was a year. I think it was more like eight months or something like that. And they really got us going. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I mean, the fact is the basics of filmmaking are very easy to teach. doesn't mean that you're going to be a great filmmaker, but you can run a camera, you can run sound, you know, so there's not that much to it. I kept, as you can see, I kept my story very contained, mm -hmm. very small. It really wasn't long after that we started, you know, making films. So, um, and Stephen, my the guy who filmed it, he was he was fresh out of university, and full of Truffaut. And <laughs> I was finding him, <laughs> and he could be kind of vacant at times, and that was driving me nuts. You know, so uh, keep you know him focused. The sound woman was a married woman, married to an Indian guy, and uh, very nice. But I mean, it was really so intense. I only had the weekend to do it too. So wow. and it was in my apartment and I hadn't asked the guy, the <laughs> landlord permission. So, I, you know, we weren't getting exaggerating on anything. It was just like, we shoot, we you know, get it done. We were, I think we were all, we were learners. Yeah. So we were, you know, no one was trying to be like, I know what I'm doing. We didn't know what we were doing. We were trying, you know. You know, if I'd had my way, what I really wanted is the opening shot to be really high, like a uh, Hitchcock, but there was a limit to how much we could crank up the camera, and I didn't want to put it on the chair because if he fell and broke his neck, 
it would be on me. Okay, I don't think I can lie here much longer. This is really killing me. It's not that profound. I think that uh, was the first film. Uh, they said, you know, write a story. I couldn't come up with a story. I thought about a friend of mine who once said to me when I was really down, which was often the case in New York, as <laughs> she said, uh, I thought, oh, I could kill myself. She said, you'll never kill yourself because you wouldn't know what to wear. I said, there's my film, you know, so it was as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously comedy is a way of protecting yourself in a way, you know, and distancing yourself from hurt, mm -hmm. maybe. Sometimes I think I should say, you know, it's a comedy, you can laugh if you want to, or chuckle, and it makes it. But I, you know, people, some, I think a lot of people don't get it, mm -hmm. that it's just, you know, it's light. Killing time, I could have left in the closet, but a friend, also a dancer from the studio, said, when are you going to show us your film? And I said, I'm not. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm not. It's for me. And they pushed me, and other friends pushed me, so we had a screening at a, a friend's house. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised at the reaction. For me, it really was, you know, yeah, it's okay. It's kind of silly, you know. But they really liked it. And so uh, the same woman said, you know, you should, there's a festival in Houston, you should enter it. And I said, uh, oh, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so she'll leave me alone, right? <laughs> and I didn't say anything for a couple of weeks. And she said, did you enter it? I said, what? And she said, the festival. I said, no. And she, so she brought me the papers. So I entered the film, you know, and I always felt like I'm being pushed in ways I don't feel right about. And I entered it, and then a couple, about a few weeks later, I got this letter from them, and I thought, you know, you know. and I'd won the second prize, and I was floored. I mean, I really, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. And so it was kind of an encouragement, you know, to keep going. I don't even, I didn't think I saw it. I think I went for the prize. And I wasn't going to do that, but I have, um, uh, at the time, a very good, dear friend, I shouldn't say good friend, and he was a man that I was involved with in different ways, who is Waldo Salt, who's a screenwriter. And I, you know, I told him I got the prize, and, and I, he said, oh, it's great, great. He said, and I said, but I'm not going. He said, you go. It doesn't happen that often. And I thought, oh, it's, you know, like this rinky-dinky film festival. But he's right. It doesn't happen that often. You know, so I was glad I went. I was just getting so fed up at the studio with, ugh, I was like in the middle of, I don't know what, now I look at it. So there were the rich people, the women who didn't have to do anything. There were the actors, some of them very famous, some of them not so famous, and the dancers, a lot of them you know, like with ABT or with New York City Ballet. And I felt, I guess I felt like I had certain talents and I, what am I doing pressing people's thighs? And I love documentaries. I love a well-made documentary. So it didn't, you know, scare me. And again, this was going to be something small, intimate, you know, and someone I knew. So I, there was nothing to be, you know, afraid of. The, the biggest fear is, would she come across interesting? Mm -hmm. Just because I find her interesting and I find the situation interesting, is that going to be interesting, you know, to anyone else? And a lot of it had to do with my working off my own anger. I mean, one of the, you know, reasons that I, as you probably read in the interviews, I was trying to push her. I just wanted her to say, you know, <laughs> which would never, she would never be vulgar, but I thought, you know, not with these white people and their, <laughs> you know, their dirty towels or, or just say, you know, I really wanted to go to university and become, well, I don't know what, you know, uh, and that wasn't going to happen. You know, so, no, I was, no, I just, I wanted, I just, I really wanted to respect her and preserve, mm -hmm. I wanted the world to see what I saw, mm -hmm. you know, and I, th I do think I managed that because, you know, you ask when I look at it now, I still see Fanny and I still, I love hearing her voice. They walk out in the hot dirt without a shoe on. My father never allowed that. We never had our foot on the ground. Robert said, okay, you can have it for the weekend. So the reason the class is sort of um, so um, homogenous is because I had to put up a sign. I said, you know, anybody willing to be in, you know, take a free class, I'll be filming. But, you know, I need people to fill the studio. So it's mostly poor dancers and 
<laughs> the rich women were at the beach or something. No, not, not that I wanted. That's not unfair. They were very nice people. Um, so we film the the you know exercise sequences, and then we film Fanny a part. And some and one obviously one time she's there at the studio as she would be in the evening. She wasn't in her own house. I never saw her house. Um, where do I? You know, it wouldn't have been my apartment. I think it was in the studio. I'm sure it was in the studio, and just her and I together, you know, talking, because I thought she'd be most comfortable that way. It was a studio mix. You can't tell from this film. Oh, so there were well-off people, there were dancers, actors, writers, ordinary people. I mean, the ordinary people were not that many, let's face it, because it's the kind of place that actors would go to keep their bodies in shape, dancers for the obvious reason, and the rich because they could. It's interesting, someone, uh, said about the film, oh, you know, it's people and their vanity. I said, you don't understand. When you're a dancer, you you look in the mirror. You're not exactly liking what you see all the time. And people, I think, have that misconception that because you're looking at yourself, you like what you see. Often it's, it's the inverse, that you, you're looking at yourself, you, you're trying to correct it or make it into something it's not. And the same with age. I mean, I remember uh, a very dear friend who's older, at the studio, she used to take classes. And sometimes I'd be teaching and I'd watch and think, what is she looking at in the mirror? But, and I realized that she was, I think sometimes for older women, you're looking in the mirror and you're trying to bring back the younger person. And it's impossible. And you make these adjustments and you don't see that, you know, it's a lost game. And you don't see and appreciate what is there. You know, and I, what I love about Fanny is that you know, she looked in that mirror, but she didn't look at herself. She was working, you know, it wasn't even, there's no vanity there, you know. And she looked so at the mirror wondering if she has to clean it. <laughs> exactly, those fingerprints again, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> They're good. The same old thing that I am today. What? Same Fanny, the same way I live today. I would like to come back and live this like how I'm living now. To me, it's like she's dancing. I mean, when you're exercising, I mean, what could be more exercise than cleaning a house? Yeah. I mean, or making a bed or something. I mean, that is exercise. Um, but she, you know, in the singing, you know, I, she didn't, she didn't want to sing because she had a, a sore throat and a croaky voice. Said, please, please, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter, you know. And I didn't tell her I was going to keep the recording, and so I had to really squeeze that singing out of her. And in some ways, she's sort of. I think I have a fascination with people from the South, you know, almost not quite Faulkner, but I grew up in Michigan, it's the North, Detroit, so my mother is from Michigan, and my father's from the South, he's from Kentucky. And when we were kids, we never went on vacation, we didn't have that kind of money. But I had a, we had a neighbor girl who went every summer to the South to visit her grandmother and boy was I envious you know so I had a I was one of those kids that had a make-believe friend mm -hmm. so I would tell my make-believe friend about oh I went to see my grandmother in the south you know <laughs> but my sister used to laugh at me but for me it was like boy oh boy to have a grandmother in the south you know that tells you all these stories and all this sort of stuff so for Fanny for me was kind of an embodiment of that south that I think is not all gone now but is going, going, gone. You know, the pattern of speaking, when she talks about her father and, you know, not ha ever being without shoes or anything, and the sort of pride about food. I mean, for a lot of poor people, just the fact that you can fill your refrigerator is success. But, you know, I think that comes from so people doesn't take care of themselves. I take good care of myself. I take a lot of rest. I mean, I get nervous sitting with my films, and even the, my little, you know, private screenings. Uh, it's excruciating. I just think, oh boy, you know, <laughs> you know, and you can feel the people. And I had one screening. I used to be with Black Filmmaker Foundation. That was the first group that took my film, you know, because the first group that took black films. And, and they were very good, I must say. They were, you know, about distributing black films to a larger audience. And they had a, um, they had their own film festival one year. And they said, you know, enter your f films. They wanted films that were made something like after 1979 or something like that. And I'm just too honest. I'm just so stupid. So 
I didn't enter Killing Time, which is the film they wanted me to enter. I entered Fanny's film. So I entered Fanny's film. I went to the, you know, this big party, this big soiree, and there was, you know, Spike Lee and all these, you know, people who I knew. I didn't really know him. I'd met him once, but he was on a roll. So, I mean, this was a different category. The Hudlin brothers, because the Hudlin brothers were, well, Red, what is it, Warrington and his wife began Black Filmmaker Foundation, you know, so we were, we weren't friendly, but we knew each other in a friendly way. And so they were going to give a prize for the best black film document, blah, blah, blah. And they put, so they showed Fanny's film. And I have to say it was among the most humiliating times of my life. Nobody understood what they were looking at. And I could hear people saying, what the hell is this? You know, and, it was, and because they didn't want to look at a, a black cleaning woman, they didn't understand what was going on. I was trying, my whole purpose was not to make a Talking Heads documentary, you know, was to shift it. I thought, you know, I'd felt for years, especially after working at ABC, people understand more than you give them credit for. They can put things together. You don't have to show them, this is a person talking about where they were, this is where they were, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I was just horrified. I mean, horrified. I thought, well, just stop the film. You know, I don't really care. Um, and that really set me back, you know, for quite a bit. So it was like a slow churn back into, even though I had people like Ellen and Muffy who really believed in the film, which was wonderful. You know, they really just thought, you know, this is something special and we believe in it, you know, but it was hard to get people to look at it and understand it. Some of the people that came to the black filmmaker things, they just, basically they're like entertainment. You know, it's like, you know, and obviously Spike Lee did very well there in Reggie Hudlin's film, The House Party or something. That's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for Fanny. Mm -hmm. And um, they might have liked Killing Time. I don't know. You know, maybe not. Uh, but at any rate, so, you know, it's sort of, it would be shown. It's not that my films weren't ever shown. They were, you know, mostly universities, for example, and sort of, um, what else? I worked for a while for Lincoln Center and film and schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't really enjoy that that much. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just felt like, well, I want to be making films. John Sales' idea, since it was about a black alien, was to have a, pretty much a half black crew, half white crew. And uh, I think for many of us, certainly for me, I really thought this is it. This is the beginning of my film career, you know. so. Um, I'd never done sound really before, so I worked as assistant sound person with this guy who was just lovely. And I enjoyed it, but my real, I think if I were to choose anything, I would choose camera. I love shooting. And it was a very good shoot, uh, and I just thought, this is the way film works. It's the way everything works. You do a good job, you're recommended to somebody else. So weeks pass, and nothing happened at the end of the film, so I thought, well, okay. You know, that's it. I asked Marco if he had, you know, any other jobs. No. And I just thought, you know what, I I think John's idea was very good. But if it's just going to end there, I just thought, you know, what the hell? But, you know, you also have to sell yourself in that business. I was incapable of selling myself. It was just a confusing time for me because I had friends, you know, kind of, of influence. And they would say, why don't you go see so-and-so? For example, I had a I was friends with an actress called Lindsay Krauss. And she said, you know, I really, she'd seen my film by now. And she said, I really, you know, you should see my agent. And I'm thinking, you know, this is like the modeling. I thought, the agent, you know, it's my little black and white film. So I don't think so. But because she insisted, I went anyway. And it was one of the top agencies in New York. I felt such a fool. And I felt like I'm taking up this man's time. He's not interested in my films. He was very polite. He was very nice, but he was not interested in my films. And there's a point where you think, why did you put myself in this position? And I felt humiliated. I felt, I shouldn't have felt stupid, but I felt you should have you know, known better. Okay, it's done. You've done that. It's not going to happen. Um, it starts to affect you. And you, I wouldn't say I became disinterested, but I think I, I just felt What's the point in beating your head against a brick wall? I mean, this is not, you either have the time or you don't, and it's off. And I've always felt that, you know, about fate. I just think, why is that person chosen and the other one isn't? When it's an equal game, not like if you, you know, so outstanding. And you just don't know why. It's just the way it is. 
you know, you have to accept it. And then I, you know, a time at NYU Film School, which is so expensive. So I spent one semester there and I was really going for broke. And so, um, you know, I was offered this job in Milwaukee to teach basic filmmaking. And one of my professors at NYU said, don't do it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lousy film school and he's not. And I thought, well, I don't know. I really need, you know, to make a living. And at least I'll be in film, you know, if I do that. So I accepted the job. And then uh, he interviewed me, yes, we want you. And I said, yes. And don't, you know, like two weeks later, I got a call from somebody, the guy I'd worked with on the sales film. He said, you know, um, Henry Hampton was looking for a sound person for a documentary. And I said, well, you know, I'm, you know, I've given my promise to Milwaukee. Well, the documentary was Eyes on the Prize. And I thought, <laughs> you know, I just can't believe, I didn't, I wasn't to know at the time that it was going to be Eyes on the Prize, but I didn't have any faith in myself. And I thought, you know, I can't do sound on my own. I'm gonna, you know, I better keep this job in teaching. So, you know, went off to Milwaukee. And I was thinking about a film that I wanted to do about a, a man called Miles Horton. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he is, um, he was called a radical hillbilly. And he has a place called Highlander in Tennessee. I'd seen an interview with him with Bill Moyers and I just was so struck with him. And I thought that's gonna be my feature film. I really thought, you know, I want to do a film about this guy's life. So um, I got in touch, you know, a friend got me in touch with Bill Moyers, who was generous enough to give me an introduction to Highlander. And so I was invited down there for their 50th anniversary celebration so I could meet Miles and you know, see the scene. And I went down and it was just, it was the most wonderful weekends in my entire life. Cause I just seeing people, I was kind of nervous about going to the South, Tennessee especially, but seeing these people who've worked together for years, you know, mixed black and white, uh, and this kind of sense of community and purpose was fabulous. You know, so, you know, I talked with Miles who couldn't have been lovelier and uh, Rosa Parks was there because that's where she got part of her training for, you know, nonviolent protests. And this woman, Septima Clark, who was uh, a teacher and she was very good friends with Rosa Parks. So it was like this weekend. I couldn't believe it, you know. And I sat with them and talked for a while and it was just lovely. And when I went back, I got the, you know, answer. He did not want a film made about his life. And I was just crestfallen because I just put, it, you know, I was already there. I already had the storyboards, you know, in my head and I was there. And, but he was very kind and gracious. And he said, you know, if you want to, I can, you know, I, you know, I can put you in touch with Septima and it might be you know, a good idea. And I didn't take it up because I was so fixed on this one you know, idea. And I really regret it to this day because that was stupid. You know, and I, but, you know, it was what it was out the window. There are times when a pool of people come together and you do, who knows why. It is like a constellation. It's just a meteor happens and then it goes away. Um, I, maybe it's because of the age I went into film. Maybe it's because of all the things I'd done before film. Uh, and maybe because New York is, I wouldn't say a selfish city, but it's not that easy. It's not, it's not like, like now I'm meeting the L.A. Rebellion people. And I think, God, how lucky they were that they had this cooperative, you know, that people, you know, joined together. And we didn't have that in New York. It could be my fault. It could be I was too arrogant. It could be that I was, you know, didn't know who to go to. It could be I was too selfish. I mean, I uh, didn't have a group to work with. I knew Ayoko Shinzira. Um, <clears throat> I never met Kathleen Collins. I, I don't know. And it doesn't make sense to me. I think, well, how could I have been there and not? you know, met her, but who knows? And someone who I don't understand how I never met is Camille Billups, whose films I just love. And I think, how could I be in the same city doing sort of the same thing? And I never met this woman. This friend called from London and he said, you said, have you seen the New York Times? And I said, no, you know, why? He said, look at it, you know? And so I looked at the, I get the Times online at any rate. And I looked at it and I said, hey, uh, you know, women's, black women's films, it'll be the usual 100, and I won't be part of it, so I'm reading it and thinking, oh, yeah, and feeling envious, of course, and thinking, you know, you know I'm not going to be on the list. And so when I got to the bottom and saw that 
Manola Dargis had singled out my films, I was just stunned, you know, because it's almost like, I literally, like you've been in a crypt and somebody opened up the thing and there's some light. It's like you burn your skin, burn your brain. Um, and I thought, wow, it's, it's wonderful. You know, and then uh, the real guy was Richard Brody. I mean, I really can't thank him enough. You know, not that he wants my thanks, but uh, because he really pinpointed it and he really understood what it must have been like to produce something and, you know, zero interest, you know. So um, so that started and it was, you know, it was just very curious. I mean, what can I say? I was just great while I was still alive. I mean, I could be dead. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have uh, one friend who's a choreographer whose work I adored, New York choreo choreographer, and she died suddenly a couple of years ago of pancreatic cancer. And, you know, and every now and then someone will talk about it, you know, what a pity, you know, Blondell isn't here to know that, mm -hmm. you know, people really appreciate her work. Or Kathleen Collins, mm -hmm. you know, had she lived. So it's extraordinary. I haven't, I don't think, I think I've been consistent throughout my life. I don't think I've really changed that much. Maybe I should have, but, but I haven't. And I would, you know, if I met Fanny today, I think we'd greet each other. I think the consistency is that I still have, like a lot of the same friends that I've had for almost 60 years. So that, that you know, you change a bit, but the real you is consistent. And the real me remains kind of working class, very um, not into pretension. Uh, I hate phoniness, I hate um, snottiness or snobbiness. I just think, what's the point? And I love reality, in a way. <laughs>